Should we put it on? Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Ah! Oh. oh shit, did I break it? Is this, is this work? I think it was for like a funny video we did or something, but um, it's also if if the guys from who, who the Daft Punk are out there, I'm ready to go. Just <laughs> if one of you like falls down in a ravine or something, I got the helmet. Well, the the name came out of the notion that we were sort of escaping from the mothership. That's what the escape pods do, don't they? Well, when everything's blowing up, where do you want to be? The escape pod. That's where you want to be. You like the building. The building was, it's not that old. It was built probably in the last 10 years. And I uh, want to go down? Yeah. I'm the only one who uses the elevator. They say that, it's your right, right? Well, you know. <laughs> but apparently it's, you're supposed to, you know, once a day use it, oh. use the elevator. So I use it every time. I never use the stairs. So I'm not being lazy. I also walk a lot, so. <laughs> 10,000 steps a day. Our thing, if you look at our website, is what it says is, we will bring your brand pr proposition to life in the most dramatic manner possible. That's what we do. So we will turn it up to 11. That's what we do on everything. Here's a good one. This is one I love. This is one, I love this one because it's very close to me. You know it's always better, good when you have like a real personal stake in what you're selling? Like I used to be that way about Budweiser. Like for example, when you know, I'd be out in a bar, you know, whatever, and pe people, you know, Occasionally I'd be in a bar, okay? Let's deal with that. And I know it's hard to believe. And, and I'd be drinking Budweiser, and then, you know, Americans would say, hey, you're Irish, what are you drinking Budweiser for? And I'd be like, oh, you just, you shouldn't open that door. Because <laughs> I was really into it. Like, I really, I thought it was a great, it is a great beer. It's got a lot, you know, it's, it's, it's great, you know, it's, it's great from every angle, right? So I was really passionate about it. Similarly, we have a client's ego it's the Tesla of lawnmowers, it's the Dyson, of, it's one of those. It's so well designed, the technology is so good, you just can't wait to tell people about it. You know, I've got them all at home, I use it all the time. This is how quiet the lawnmower is. You can hear the grass being cut. Wow, yeah, I know. <laughs> one of the things I think helped us get in there was they introduced a snowblower. So what we did was we were trying to think what's the most dramatic way to demonstrate snow blowing, right? Minnesota isn't cutting it, you know, for me. So we went off to Antarctica and we blew some snow. The great thing about this snowblower is it starts first time every time, which you've ever had a snowblower. That's the biggest problem with snowblowers. They never start when you need them. This one does. How we got there, because it's very hard to get to Antarctica, you know. You can't just, you have to get, get permission to get in there. A childhood friend of mine is actually one of the world's foremost ultra marathoners. And he does, leads marathons to the South Pole. It's like Forrest Gump. So he managed to get us in with the snowblowers. But it was very much touch and go and hard to get into. It was like, it was a polar expedition. Fly in on a Soviet freight plane, and, you know, the whole bit. It's crazy. This is Antarctica. The coldest, windiest, most hostile environment on Earth. This is the Ego Power Plus Snowblower, driven by arc lithium battery technology. It starts the first time, every time, everywhere. This is power beyond belief. That's got energy and novelty and there's something new about it. And that just makes your life so much easier. When you don't have to make stuff up. You know, where it's just like, hey, I'm just going to tell you about this because it's so great. Like if you look at our work, for example, the Toys R Us stuff we did, where we took a bunch of kids and gave them the run of the store and just filmed them running around the store picking up their toys, you know. It was like... That was so much fun to do, and it was so right on the money. Like, we're, we're literally in the store, you know? We're, what are we selling? Toys? No, we're selling going to the store. 
And so, and we're capturing the emotion, the real emotion, and all that sort of stuff. It's like, nine times out of ten, if it's fun to do, it'll be fun to, for everybody else to, to watch or to interact with. But we're not going to the forest today. We're going to Toys R Us, guys. And you're going to get to choose any toy that you want. Welcome to the world's greatest toy store. I'm about to cry. It's my best toy ever. A princess is always loyal and never gives up and always follows her dreams. You know, and to get that, you need to have that leeway to, to be fresh with it. You know? Like when we did the What's Up campaign, there was, there, was no, I don't think there was no clients on the shoot. There was a, there was a campaign called I Love You Man. Remember I Love You Man? And I was like, that's the perfect, perfect beer ad. You know, it really was. And, the, and it was perfect in so many ways. And there was a catchphrase associated with it, you know. I love you, man. People would say, I love you, man. To, guys would say, I love you, man, to each other. And I f was very interested in this phenomenon. It's mostly because when I go to parties and people would say, what do you do? I work in advertising. What do you work on? Bottle light. Did you do I love you, man? <sighs> no, I didn't. So I had plenty of time to study why that worked. And my conclusion was that it, it basically gave, you know, frat boys permission to tell their friends they love them. And that was the key to it. It had a use, and it was fun, and it was pre-packaged -pack comedy for friends to use among friends. So, having learned that lesson and not done that ad, I, don't, I, I was always kind of on the lookout for, for that. You know what I mean? Like, looking out for it. And, uh, and so I was, I, was, I was working actually at Publicis here in Chicago. Shortly before, uh, before I went back to, to DDB. I, was, I, was, I went away for two years, came back. Again, DM claim, and so, and so um, while I was there, a producer friend of mine, Carol King, not the singer, showed me a, D, a VHS of this short film, and the short film featured Charles Stone and his buddies um, saying what's up to each other over the phone. It was like two minutes, two and a half minutes long, and I was uh, I, I was thought it was hilarious. Yeah, then I, the more I watched it, the more I went, oh, wait a minute. Firstly, I couldn't stop saying what's up, and nobody could. If you saw this movie, you're like, what are you saying what's up? Right? That was the first thing. I'm like, oh, oh, got it. The second thing I loved about it was the situation they were in. They were watching sports. Where does Budweiser add his room? Sports, right? So it was kind of perfect in that regard. We didn't have any Budweiser in it. That was, you know, that was my idea to add Budweiser. So... And then, that, that, and so what I did was I, I had this tape, right? I showed it to Don when I got back to DDB, and he was like, "Yep, catchphrase maybe. Yep, why not?" We showed it to um, the client. They were like, "Yeah, why not? Just give it a shot." You know, they were they would buy like 40 spots for the Super Bowl. This was one of those, and and, when we, and then we shot it uh, around Christmas time, right? And when we finished it, August pushed the fourth. Yeah. Took a copy of it to a bar or restaurant in St. Louis and put it into the TV and played it. And the whole bar went nuts. And he, and he got on the phone to the agency and said, put it on the NBA on Christmas Day. It was supposed to be for the Super Bowl, but it went on Christmas Day. And within weeks, people were shouting it all over the, America and the world. Hello? So what's up, B? Watching the game, having a bud. True. True. And it was crazy. I mean, it was like literally exactly what we'd hoped and more. You know what I mean? It was one of those, you're scared almost because it's, you know, you want to stop. <laughs> it just got, you know, went out of control then. You know? The odd part about the What's Up campaign was, in addition to getting that pop culture effect of the catchphrase and all that, the internet just devoured it. And there was all these parodies appeared online. And, and it got to the point where we actually didn't have to do any advertising because people were doing it for us. And they were doing, oh, you know, we, we would see an ad and go, yeah, we had that idea, that's a pretty good one. You know, and there were all these parodies popping up and that's kind of made it this crazy thing that went all around the world, you know. Like, I'll, I'll give you a good example. Um, we shot that in December. And I remember I went back to Ireland with my family in March to Galway. And I was walking out of the pub in, uh, Closing time. Everybody was, because it's closing time. And the square was filled with all these young 
Irish beer drinkers, you know? And they're all shouting at each other, what's up? And I'm like, how the hell did that happen? So like, and a couple of weeks later, we're in New York and we're shooting the, f the sequels, you know, to the first round of, of ads. We shot four the first time. And we were all in our, it was Saturday night. We'd shot like six days in one, we're drained. Saturday night, tired as hell. And we're in the lobby of our hotel. It's around nine o'clock or something in New York time. And, uh, and all our phones go off and, and it's all our families and friends going, oh my God, they just opened the Saturday Night Live, the season premiere of Saturday Night Live with a parody of your campaign, right? Now, ordinarily, that would be cause for like jumping up and down and high-fiving. This was us. Oh yeah? That's great. Where do you want to go to eat? You know, <laughs> like, it was crazy, you know? You know what I mean? And we we're like, yeah, okay, great. Yeah, it's on Saturday Night Live. Well, of course it is, you know? As opposed to, oh my God, you know? We won at the Clio's, the Grand Clio, and we won the um, everything, basically. And then the big one, Can. you know, we go out to Can for a week, you know, with Bob and Keith and all those guys. And it was great fun. The whole week, we were there the whole week, too. And by the way, you know what we did? This is how naive we were. We didn't figure that a week in Can was enough partying for us. So my, f my partner, Justin, he was looking at a map of the world, and he goes, Hey, you know, Amsterdam's on the way to Can. And I'm like, we should stop off there for a few days, should we? So by the time we got back, we were just basically, you know, barely alive. Uh, and so we got there, and it became apparent to me very quickly that it was, we, were, we were expected to win. And that if we didn't win the Grand Prix, it would be a bit of a disappointment to DDB. And I was like, oh, that's all I need, you know? Come on, guys, you know? And, uh, and so by the Thursday of, of Cannes, you know, when, when they announced, I think they, 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 they announced the Grand Prix on Friday or something, or whatever. By Thursday, I'm like feeling the pressure right here, you know? And I'm wandering around Cannes, and I'm like, oh, we better win, we better win. And I walk into the uh, Intercontinental in Cannes, and uh, um, our head of production walks over to me with a big smile on his face, and he goes, Vinny, congratulations on having the best ad in the world. And I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> Did we win? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we won. <laughs> I spent like my teenage years working in a pub in Ireland, you know, like from the age of 15 to 21. I know. <laughs> and I was the oldest in the bar. <laughs> no, it was a very young bar, you know. And, but it was crazy busy, you know. And so I got a real good feel for how you sell beer, you know, in the, in the real world. What works, what doesn't work, you know. And there was a lot of really good beer campaigns in England in the 80s. And I loved those things, and I really wanted to do that. That was my fantasy, was to do beer campaigns like the ones I grew up with. And I, and I, and I kind of knew about the category, you know, I had a, feeling, a feel for it, right? And so, and when I, get, when I got to working on Bud Light, I was like, finally, the use of all my skills, you know? While in London, I worked for their TV, com commercial TV network called ITV, and that gave me a sort of a glimpse into the world of advertising in London. And I kind of liked it, the look of it, you know? But I didn't fancy doing what I was doing, which was selling airtime. So I took some classes with the DNAD, you know DNAD? And they had this workshop series, and I, and I got enough positive reinforcement, not a lot, but some, from those classes that made me think I could do it, you know, for real. And right around then, I got a green card in a lottery. Uh, and so I was like, and, you, and you, it was one of those things where you, you had to um, use it in a certain time frame or was, would expire. So I kind of had a time pressure on, and I'm like, okay, I'll go to New York, and I'll try and make it in advertising there. So that was where I led me to New York. And before I left London, I asked a few people, you know, who should I work for in, in, the, in New York? And then the same name came up a few times, and I'm like, mm, that's the guy. And the guy's name was Ed McCabe, kind of a legend of American advertising from the 60s and 70s and 80s. So I basically targeted him kind of exclusively. It took me two years, but he finally heard me. What attracted me to the Ed McCabe School of Advertising was it was very hard hitting and just so strategically on the money. You know, like he did this famous campaign for uh, Hebrew National Hot Dogs, which, you know, the 70s, right when the fitness boom was kind of happening, you know, jogging and all that stuff. And guess what was going out of fashion? Hot dogs, right? And so, so but uh, Hebrew National were kosher. So they had to adhere to the dietary standards of 
you know, Judaism. And so they couldn't have fillers and preservatives and all the stuff that make, among other things, make hot dogs less than good food. And so he turned it into, um, this is God's hot dog. And it's better than the government. And it's, it's just perfect judo, st strategic judo. Government regulations say we can make our Hebrew national beef hot dogs from frozen beef. We don't. The government says we can use artificial coloring. We don't. They say we can add meat byproducts. We don't. They say we can add non-meat fillers. We can't. We're kosher and have to answer to an even higher authority. He, he was the planner. That was sort of, that was the, that was the the model of the 60s. The, 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 the copywriter usually was also the strategic thinker. I'm more of an ideas person and that was, you know, if you've got a great idea, it writes itself, doesn't it? There you go. <laughs> the glory years, the madman era, yeah. And he was one of those, like through him, I got to meet Bob Levinson and Helmut Krohn and, you know, David Abbott and all these kind of legends and George Lewis and all those people. Well, this is my first job. I was, doing, I was writing, this is what I was doing, I was writing, you know those tray liners for like fast food? Yeah, that was, that was what I was doing. It'll be one double cheeseburger, ching. Large fries and a large soda, ching, ching. Two kids meals and two medium sodas, ching. One chicken sandwich, large fries and a vanilla milkshake, bada bing. That'll be $62.75. The thing about Ed McKay was, and is and was, was that he was um, so adrenalized. I remember reading people saying quotes about that, and it was so true. Like, he was always ready to go, you know. The, and so, he, consequently, he worked really fast, and he was very decisive, and he, knew, he just knew what he wanted, you know. There was no hemming and or hawing. When I first went to New York, rather than get a job in media, which I could have done, I took a job as a horse and carriage driver driving around Central Park. And I consciously did that because I, I didn't want it to be like a kind of a resume burner, you know. What I did was I took some night classes at the School of Visual Arts by a guy named Sal DeVito. He was famous for like throwing people's ads out the window and setting them on fire. And he did that to me once. He, threw my, he set my ad on fire and threw it out the window. So what I would do is I would look for interviews with Ed for, and I would, or, you know, passing references to products he might use in an interview and I would create a campaign for that. And then the other thing I did was, uh, you remember, you remember Kirschenbaum and Bond? He hated them. And I found this out in an interview. So what I did was I submitted a book of really bad ads to Kirschenbaum and Bond so I could get the rejection letter. And the rejection letter went to the front of my book to Ed and it said, uh, it said, um, Dear Ed McCabe, I hope your idea of great advertising isn't the same as Messrs. Kirschenbaum and Bond. Right? The next step was kidnapping him, you know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, one of the great things about his advertising was you couldn't argue with it. Right? And if you can't argue with something, you're halfway to agreeing with it. So, and I think that we're advertising, you know, traditionally and still, you know, they, they, t they tend to live in their own little bubble of ad world where things that are moderately amusing are supposed to be hilarious, you know, and things that are kind of cool are supposed to be really cool, you know, everything gets distorted. Whereas that's only for us. The outside world, is, there's no distortion out there. And so one of the things that I, I always thought about advertising was the biggest problem with advertising is it's bullshit, right? Its reputation is, it's lies and bullshit, right? Okay, what's the way out of that? Reality, there's one way out of that. Undeniably real, undeniably true. That works a hell of a lot better than anything I can come up with, I think. So the, the wheat thins thing was interesting because it was, uh, it was one of those situations where, you know, snack advertising, like beer advertising, f tends to follow very familiar tropes, I guess is the word, or whatever. And the most familiar one be, oh my God, we're out of this snack. High jinx ensue, you know? And it just wasn't going to freshen up the brand enough. So, uh, so we decided, well, we're not going to do that. And once you decide you're not going to do everything that's usually been done, you have to come up with something else to replace that, because you still have to do an ad for it, right? So having rejected all that stuff, we were like, okay, what do we do, what do we do? And we're literally at lunch, where all the best ideas happen, at a tapas restaurant, no less, and somebody pulled out their phone, I don't know who it was, and we searched Twitter, and we found this like avalanche of love for Wheatons. And I couldn't believe it. And I'm like, that's crazy. I mean, let's look. And, and it ranged from like boring stuff to I'm, I'm eating me a whole box of wheat thins to creepy and weird and 
odd things to you know, everything. So we had the idea then of like, well, you know, the one thing you don't expect to happen when you tweet about a snack is that there'd be a consequence to that. You don't expect somebody to show up at your door, for example, with a bit of visual comedy and film the whole thing. So uh, that's what we did. Okay, do you recall tweeting, ah, I'm out of wheat thins, my life is officially over. Yeah. We got a hold of that. We just want you to be sure that you're aware that we have plenty of wheat thins. You know, I, love when, I love when people think, you know, like they would say, you know, oh, that, that was fake. It's like, it's so much easier to do it for real than it is to fake it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's so, I never understood that. Anyway, so we, we did that and it was really fun. And the best part about it was, you know, because people are watching TV with their phones out, they would start tweeting about the commercials that were t about the tweets about the snack and the whole thing became this sort of circle. And the great thing about it, about doing all that stuff is you have so little control, you know? You know, for all we know, they could show up at the door naked with a shotgun you know, we don't, until we, we don't know. Our main criteria is that the people we deal with want to get stuff done and they, they want, you know, they, they want, they're action oriented. I prefer to work with more entrepreneurial, decision, decisive, action-oriented people. One of the reasons that the Budweiser stuff was so good was the client were like, let's get it done. We gotta sell this stuff. They were very, you wouldn't think it, because you know, Anheuser-Busch was such a big company, but it was like, uh, they were on fire or something. I was like, guys, you got the number one and number two beer in the world. I think you're all right here. Oh no, not enough. People are drinking milk. They should be drinking Bud Light. We do. I mean, I'm not. I'm not averse to, to to research. I think the the time to do research though is before you do the ad, and not you know, don't let it don't don't let it drive the content. Don't te don't don't test the ideas, because you know who the hell knows how to how to uh, evaluate a TV ad who isn't in the industry. You're just it's asking too much. I think that you know research can be great for like for getting you know, qualitative research is the best. You know that's why I used to, I used to go to the Budweiser focus groups. Just so I could write down the cool things that people would say. Go, oh yeah, that's a great episode. And people just say things. You know what I mean? That's why it's great. You know, I'm a student of sort of um, media and the history of the media and all that stuff. And uh, I used to work in the media. It was my first job. I was working for a television company. Advertising is only as good as the audience it reaches. And I think what's undeniably what's happened to the marketing industry and advertising industry over the last 15 years, the bane of it has been the distraction of shiny objects. You know, what's the next thing to come along? Oh, if you're not on, if you know, if you don't have a blog, you're, you know, if you don't have a microsite, if you don't have a Vine, you know, it's, it's like, it's become very, uh, like childishly, easily distracted. The industry has been. So my answer to that is obviously we have to be as interesting as we can, but not at the expense of selling stuff. That's where it's gotten wrong. I mean, how many times have you seen these ads where it's like, they're trying to, like now, they're trying to like, um, you know, wind you up emotionally, you know. You know what I mean? All that, you know, oh, the Afghan veteran came home with his dog, and now we're going to give him a Budweiser, and then we're going to, you know. It's like dudes, you know. You know what I mean? It's like, not everything should be maudlin and, you know, it's so shareable, you know. It, 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 everything can't be the same, just as everything, when everything was funny, quote unquote, in the 90s, that was equally weird in my estimation. Like, how about you let form follow function? You know? That's my thing. Just let, if you let form follow function, you'll be okay. It's when you start trying to jam things in that shouldn't be there, that are bullshit, usually, that's where it goes astray. And I think the advertising industry kind of lost, it, the, 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 lost its, uh, or first forgets its original direct directive. Would you just tell people things? Be human. That's all. It's related to the fact that it's getting harder and harder to reach people, and you have to be able to reach people whatever manner possible. It's having the expertise and the savvy in areas that we wouldn't ordinarily have expertise and savvy, so we bring in the people who do have that. And it's great because we work as one. When I get into advertising today, I would ask myself those two questions. Where do I want to live? And ideally, you're getting out of your hometown. And who is the person I want to work for? And who can I learn most from? Like, I didn't get into advertising until I was 22 or 23 in terms of getting interested in it. I'd already, you know, but in, but in the process, I, you know, had interesting life experiences. You know, I'd lived, moved around. I'd been to, lived in London. I lived in New York. I had crazy jobs. I met a bunch of cra had crazy experiences, you know. 
and I had a sense of the real world before I got into advertising. It's best learned by doing. It's like cooking. It's better to cook than it is to read about cooking. I think advertising can sometimes be a thing that people think is sort of glamorous and cool on some level, and they get into it for the wrong reasons. Because as we all know, it's also a lot of work and a lot of stress and a lot of you know, uncertainty and you know, there's a lot of things going to this, make this business what it is. Now I'm willing to put up with that because I enjoy it and I think I'm good at it. I mean, this is a thinking business, right? You're as good as your thoughts. You know, you've got to bring it, you've got to give it your spin. My spin on beer advertising was, um, oh, I'm going to do the stuff like the, it's saw in the England in the 80s, you know? And like, you know, funny, you know, stuff. Not like American beer advertising. It was di I had a different idea of what I wanted. Yeah. That was the other thing. Yeah, but, but when I got into advertising, that's how it was. You know, women would work on certain things and guys would work on other things. It was kind of silly when you think about it. So my f very first beer spot, which was Ad Age's beer spot of the year, by the way, I figured out, because I was looking at, you know, I was trying to look for something that everybody else wasn't doing. And most commercials for Bud Light at the time featured like, you know, a bunch of bros running out of beer and high jinx and sue, right? That was it. So my thing about it was, was like, hey, number one, I go to any 7-Eleven, I can get a six pack of Bud Light for five bucks. It's not really a problem. It just didn't strike me as a good strategy. And one thing I noticed was when I went out to bars looking at, you know, who was drinking this, it was all, I noticed a lot of women were drinking Bud Light, right? And I was like, how come there's no commercials for women? Because you know, in, in Bud Light Land commercials, women were usually like shrieking because there's a dog, you know what I mean? They're always, eh, you know, the bimbos, basically, are never the lead. So I was like, I'm going to do one with a girl. Because there, there, there was a couple of rules in, every, in Bud Light Land. One of them seemed to be, it was a, it's a young guy in a modern setting, and uh, you can't drink alone. So my first commercial had a woman in, from the 50s, it looked like, in a steam train, and she was drinking alone. And nobody, nobody seemed to notice that, because it was a slapstick commercial. So there was a guy in it, but he was subservient to the girl. He was begging her to not to leave him, and he's running after the steam train that she's leaving on, and she's got a Bud Light. That train hasn't even left the station. <laughs> she's already got a Bud Light on <laughs> And he runs after her, and he runs into a pole. That was it. And I remember, I didn't say that. I didn't go, hey guys, you know how you guys don't do any commercials for women, and women are drinking it? I just factor that into my thinking, because I was looking for something that would come off as different, and it would be automatically different if the uh, lead character in the, in the ad was a woman, a young woman. <laughs> That's kind of funny. I have the Wookiee hair. I think they were probably having, having a go at American culture. Space man. Space man. <laughs> I like our little escape booth as well. It's so cool. It's completely soundproof. <laughs> well, we, we recently had a party in this space. A fire themed party. So burn your demons. It's sort of a neo pagan summer bacchanal. You could beat up a car with a sledgehammer. For the money went to charity. We had a metal band. We made a wicker band and burned them. And that was a lot of fun. So I met my partner, Norm. So we left and started the escape pod and OfficeMex, one of our former clients at DDB, came with us. I'm going to be paying for things today with nothing but pennies. And that was our start and we just, you know, we started from there. The thing that distinguishes us, I think, is two things is uh, our, we're, 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 I think we're very on the money strategically. It's the basic thing, you know, hit the dartboard. You gotta hit the dartboard. And then how we execute is, is what, we, we've done it all. We've done everything from TV shows, to viral videos, to regular old commercials. Like I always wanted to do, you know, that sort of Ed McCabe style, hard hitting stuff like for Volvo. This is sort of my chance to do that, and I love it. Make some noise tonight, baby! Yeah.